And we all know that I like to start this program promptly. So hello all and welcome. I'm Marika Vander Steinhoven, the Special Collections Education and Outreach Librarian here at Bowdoin College. And I'm joined today by Kat Sefko, who is our department director. Thank you all so much for being here for our March page turning event of John James Audubon's Double Elephant Folio Birds of America. This is a monthly tradition that we do here at Bowdoin and we're so delighted that so many of you um, are able to join us um, uh, for this uh, monthly event. Um, welcome to all of you, wherever you're zooming in from. I see one, uh, one note in the chat um, that someone's joining us in from Bodenham, where uh, they have seen several bluebirds. So feel free to utilize the chat throughout the program. We will be doing Q&A via the Q&A um, forum, which you can find in the lower bottom toolbar. And you can submit your questions throughout the program. I'm going to give you a little heads up about some upcoming programs. Um, introduce our guest speaker, who I am so thrilled um, is joining us today. And then Pat and I will flip the bird and turn things over to our speaker. So um, for those of you joining us, uh, perhaps for the first time, this is a monthly um, program. And I'll let you know about the next two scheduled page turning events. So we're here in March. On April 2nd, we're delighted to welcome Marshall Elif, who is Bowdoin class of 1997, who is a project leader at eBird. And then on May 7th, we're uh, delighted to welcome for the second time, Peter Logan, who is author of Audubon, America's Greatest Naturalist and His Voyage and of Discovery to Labrador. Uh, Peter is also a member of the class of 1975, and this will be his second time um, uh, joining us for a page turning event. So we're delighted for that. Um, I also want to let you know about two other upcoming programs uh, that are part of our Beyond the Reading Room Archives in the World series that seeks to help us situate how archival collections are meaningful to researchers, to artists, and beyond. So coming up later this month on Wednesday, March 24th at 10.30 a.m., we're delighted to welcome the book artist Angela Lorenz, who splits her time between Maine and Bologna, Italy. And she'll be discussing how archives and historical materials influence her work. Then on April 9th, Kid Longsrich Analy, who is class of 2003 and currently serves as the Director of Research at the Massachusetts Historical Society, will give a talk entitled, Nothing Like Having a Good Repository, the archivist teacher, counselor, and diversifier of the past. For more information about these programs, you can visit our website, which is library.bowden.edu backslash arch. And I'll pop that link into the chat in just a moment. So today I am I'm so thrilled and delighted to uh, welcome our guest speaker, Scott Widenstall. He was so gracious when I sent an e a, sort of out of the blue email, um, asking him if he would be interested in joining us for this program. Um, and he was so gracious and enthusiastic and I have so enjoyed our correspondence um, and phone calls um, about Audubon, but also about all things birds. So we're delighted to have him here. Um, to give you a bit of context, Scott Widenstall is the author of more than two dozen books on natural history, including the Pulitzer Prize finalist Living on the Wind, Return, Return to Wild America, and The First Frontier. His newest book, A World on the Wing, about global migration, will be released in March 2021. Widensall is a contributing editor for Audubon, a columnist for Birdwatcher's Digest, and writes for a variety of other publications, including Living Birds. He is also an active field researcher studying solid owl migrations for more than two decades, as well as winter hummingbirds, bird migration in Alaska, and the winter movements of snowy owls through Project Snowstorm, which he co-founded. He's also been involved in the recent publication of Peter Victory's The Birds of Maine, which he'll be talking a little bit more about. And I know that he has spent many, um, many years and, and much time on Hog Island um, here in Maine. Um, so some wonderful main connections. Um, so Scott, thank you so much for joining us. 
um, I, I'm going to switch over my camera now so that you can all see, um, we're going to say goodbye to one of Audubon's mystery birds. Um, here it is. Uh, this is the Cuvier's kinglet. And if you missed last month's page turning, I would encourage you to visit our Audubon website. Um, we had uh, our studi a student, Katie Galetta, who's a member of the class of 2021, uh, did a fabulous interpretation of that. So I would encourage you to check that out. Um, Kat and I are going to now um, reposition ourselves. We have clean hands that we've just recently washed. We don't handle this book with gloves um, because it, we lose a sense of tactility. Um, but we are going to uh, now flip the bird and then hand things over to you, Scott. <laughs> Going here. Oh my God, that looks good. I see you taking this with you around. All right. And now over to you, Scott. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Marika. And, and, and absolutely, um, you could not have picked a better page to turn to, given the fact that um, growing up in, in eastern Pennsylvania in the shadow of Hawk Mountain, um, raptors have been kind of central to my life since I was a little kid. And um, red-shouldered hawks like that pair that um, Audubon painted in, in uh, Louisiana are among the most beautiful raptors in the world. I'm just, I'm, I've always been absolutely taken with red-shouldered hawks. Um, so thank you so much for, for having me here. Um, it's it's a, a pleasure to have anything to do with uh, with Audubon's Birds of America. I mean, it's just such a, such a monumental and important piece of uh, ornithological history. And, and actually, I'm here to talk a little bit about Maine ornithological history today. Um, you know, Marika mentioned the fact that um, I've been involved with the, uh, the publication of the new Birds of Maine, which my, my late friend Peter Vickery had worked on for decades. And what I'd like to do is, um, I'm gonna sh screen share here and I've got a, I can, I can give you something a little better to look at than me. I'm gonna turn my video off just to save on, um, just to save on, bandwidth because I'm, I'm over in Milton, New Hampshire, and we do not have terrific Wi-Fi where we are. Um, so the, the Birds of Maine was, um, was published, it came out in, in November of, uh, of last year, and it, um, it represents really the life work of uh, Peter Vickery, who, although a, a native of Pennsylvania, um, had, had spent much of his adult life in Maine and became really one of the, the, the leaders of Maine's ornithological community. Um, uh, the book also represents a, a really a labor of love on behalf of a large team of, of editors and co-authors and artists and cartographers and designers in order to, to bring Peter's vision to fruition following his untimely death from cancer in, uh, in 2017. Um, when Peter moved to Maine in the 1970s and began birding in the state, this is a picture of him on the Blue Nose Ferry to Nova Scotia in the 1970s, um, his, his Bible was um, Ralph Palmer's book, Maine Birds. Um, this was the Bible of, uh, of Maine ornithology for many years. He was, he was thrilled to become friends with Palmer, but he soon found that however authoritative Palmer's book was, it, you know, it was published in 1949. So it was increasingly outdated even by the 70s and 80s. And so Peter began gathering material uh, to do an update. Uh, he started with an annotated checklist to the birds of Maine that he published in 1978, along with Maine Audubon. And in addition to his, his really extensive um, field work, Peter gathered volumes of old records and hunted down all these obscure, long out of print uh, journals and articles. He corresponded with hundreds of birders across the state, gathering their records and their observations, all with the goal of creating a comprehensive update to, to Palmer's original book. And he was making great progress on this when he got a diagnosis of what turned out to be terminal esophageal cancer, cancer in 2015. At that point, he had pulled together really all the data that he needed for nearly all of Maine's 640 
464 um, species of birds, and he'd written about 350 of the species accounts. But it was it was clear to Peter's doctor that he was not going to be able to carry this um, across the finish line, and so the doctor advised Peter to pull together a team to uh, to help him finish the book, and so he did. Um, he had already recruited his good friend Bill Sheehan there on the on the right in the blue jacket. Um, uh, Bill is from Aroostook County and uh, was drafting the waterfowl accounts, that's Bill's specialty, and also providing a northern Maine perspective on the project. And so to that team, Peter added his good friend Charles Duncan on the left, with whom he taught seabird workshops at, at UMaine Machias, and Charles had also served as the director of the Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network. Um, Peter also um, added Jeff Wells, who um, when Jeff was a young man, was, uh, had been Peter's field assistant during Peter's uh, graduate work studying the Kennebunk Plains and grassland birds. Um, Jeff is now a vice president in charge of boreal songbird conservation for the National Audubon Society. Um, Peter asked me to serve as managing editor, and after Peter's death in 2017, his wife, uh, Barbara, who had just retired after 30-some years with the Nature Conservancy, um, joined me as the co-editor. And I think everybody on the Birds of Maine team um, recognizes that it was primarily due to Barbara's leadership that the project was completed last year on time and actually under budget. And the result, as I said, was, was published in November of last year. It is a 642-page testament to Peter. Um, it includes um, detailed species accounts of every species, well, as I said, 600, or 464, I keep, I keep um, reversing numbers there, 464 species that have ever been recorded in the state, in, including extinct species, uh, birds like great auk and Labrador duck and passenger pigeon that are long gone. Um, the book was made possible um, through hundreds of private donors um, from a significant gift by the Nuttall Ornithological Club down in Cambridge, which was co-publisher with Princeton University Press, and um, through partnerships with Maine Audubon and the Maine Outdoor Heritage Fund. And everybody on the Birds of Maine team um, was involved as a volunteer so that all the proceeds from the book are going into a special fund at Maine Audubon that will be used for the conservation of Maine's birds. And Maine has a lot of birds to conserve. Um, you know, its position as the largest and most northerly state in New England with, depending on how you measure it, between 2,000 and 5,000 miles of coastline, thousands of islands, um, habitat that ranges from southern oak forests to boreal bogs to spruce forests to blueberry barrens and down east. Um, because of that diversity, Maine packs a remarkable variety of, of birds in its, in its land area, including species that one would normally associate with the deep south, like nesting snowy egrets, um, and northern specialties like uh, boreal chickadees, blackback woodpeckers, uh, Canada jays. It's the only state in the US with nesting Atlantic puffins, and that, of course, is thanks to groundbreaking conservation work over the last 40 years that was spearheaded by Project Puffin at the National Audubon Society. A lot of seabird conservation techniques that are being used around the world were developed um, in the state of Maine. So the book starts with um, some extensive introductory chapters that were written by the, the editors and the co-authors, along with a number of outside experts. Um, they cover a lot of ground exploring why Maine has the birds that it has, um, how human history has shaped Maine's avifauna, how it continues to shape its avifauna. Um, we look at Maine's birds through the, the lens of the state's topography, um, the climate and the land, how the complex ocean currents in the Gulf of Maine um, exert a really profound influence on the mainland. Um, and we take a look at Maine's ornithological history from the time of European settlement up through the present, including um, some notable figures. John James Audubon, of course, you know, Audubon came through Maine on his way to Labrador. And, and by the way, if you have not read Peter Logan's wonderful book about Audubon's expedition to Labrador, I highly recommend it. Um, and people like, like Theodore Roosevelt, who I think the average person doesn't really associate with Maine, but um, someone whose conservation ethos was, was partially formed in Maine as well as pioneering uh, female ornithologists like Cordelia Stanwood. We take a really deep, um, highly detailed dive into the state and conservation needs of Maine's birds, you know, which species are thriving, which ones are not doing so well, what kinds of conservation efforts we need to protect them and preserve them for the future. 
And it was Peter's goal and, and definitely ours and the rest of the team to produce a book that was as aesthetically attractive as it was ornithologically rich. Richard, uh, Peter said that very often. And we were very fortunate to have um, cartographer Bill Hancock create some really stunning maps um, for the book, hundreds of maps, including end papers showing the full main coast and, and all the seabird breeding islands, uh, regional maps showing all the important bird areas and range maps for every species of bird that reaches a range limit in the state, including a lot of maps that show how a species abundance and distribution have changed over time. Along the same lines, we were, we were thrilled that Peter's old friend Lars Johnson from Sweden, who is arguably the most revered bird artist in the world, um, agreed early on to create a series of watercolors for the book, including the cover. Um, Lars made a number of research trips to Maine uh, with Peter in order to observe and paint um, iconic Maine bird species like Bicknell's thrush in the high elevation spruce forests of Maine's mountains, um, olive sided flycatchers in Maine's extensive um, bog wetlands, and I think probably my favorite, um, I'm very badly biased here, but uh, snowy owls up in the farmland of Arista County. If I ever commit grand larceny, it would probably be to steal that particular Lars Johnson painting. We were also really fortunate to have the help of Maine native um, and now noted Massachusetts bird artist, Barry Van Dusen, who in addition to providing hundreds of his existing ink and pencil drawings for the book, um, also created dozens of commission drawings specifically for, uh, for the birds of Maine. So the, uh, the majority of the book is made up of uh, these extensive, extensive species accounts, um, each of which details that particular bird's status in Maine. Uh, we look both, both at their status today and also historically, uh, there's notes on its conservation uh, condition. But I think the meat of each account really lies in these highly detailed seasonal sections that cover migration timing, breeding, high counts, late dates, rare records. They're, they're an incredibly complete summary of pretty much everything that we know about that particular species in Maine. Um, and in many, in many cases, the accounts also include migration maps that are based on the latest tracking data. This is something that, that so far as we know, no other state bird book has ever done, uh, showing where Maine's birds go at other times of the year when they're not here. Because for some species, like the wimbrels you see on that two-page spread, they're only passing through Maine on hemispheric migrations that carry them um, from the Northwest Territories, um, in some cases, all the way down into South America. One of the cool things about the birds of Maine is that it gives us a long view. You know, we've taken a 70 year window from the time of uh, the publication of Palmer's book up until now. So it gives us an opportunity to see how Maine's avifauna has changed over the past seven decades or so. Um, some of the species have done extraordinarily well. Canada geese were not even a nesting species in Maine until a few were released in the 1950s and they now breed pretty much everywhere, including many of the most remote offshore islands. In fact, if you look at it statistically, their numbers have increased 46,000% since the 1960s, which is impressive, but wild turkeys have actually done even better. Since they were reintroduced to the state in the 1970s, they have increased 810,000% in the state of Maine. By contrast though, um, bank swallows, which were once very common summer residents throughout Maine, um, have declined so badly that today, only two tenths of 1% of their 1966 population remains in the state um, and, and those mostly just in the Southern counties. When you look at the big picture of, of Maine's birds, a couple of points really jump out at you. One is that many of the species that are doing very well are species that have benefited from, from concerted conservation action, um, either reintroduction programs for species like turkeys and Atlantic puffins, um, focused protection like um, posting um, piping plover wardens along Maine's beaches to, to protect the uh, nesting plovers from disturbance or, or the banning of especially pernicious pesticides like DDT, um, after which bald eagles and peregrine falcons and ospreys and, and cormorants have been able to recover. The groups of birds that are in the biggest trouble in, in Maine today it, are generally the ones that depend on, on specialized and increasingly fragmented and threatened habitats. Um, habitats like, like grasslands, um, shrublands and thickets, wetlands. 
although these also probably hold the greatest chance for, for quick returns on conservation action. If we can focus conservation action on protecting and restoring those habitats, um, we can restore and protect uh, the bird populations that depend on them. What's gonna be harder to tackle is the plight of aerial insectivores. These are birds like swifts and swallows and night jars that feed on the wing on insects. Bank swallows, I mentioned a moment ago that can, they're in such terrible condition. These, have, these groups of birds have experienced some of the steepest declines of, of Maine's hundreds of nesting species. And the root is probably the so-called insect apocalypse, this global collapse of insect populations that we're seeing from climate change, pesticide use, um, habitat alteration. That's gonna be a much trickier um, problem to try to solve. One of the important points that we, we've stressed repeatedly in this book is the, 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 the importance of Maine for the protection of a particular group of birds. I mean, Maine is 90% forest. It's the most heavily wooded state in the United States. And so large percentages of the global populations of many species of birds, especially neotropical migrants, birds that migrate back and forth between Maine and, and, the, and the New World tropics, depend on Maine. Like Maine, for example, holds almost 20% of the global population of black-throated blue warblers, more than 15% more than of the world's black Bernian warblers. And by the way, if you're a birder and you think it's odd to see a black Bernian warbler hopping around on the rocks, you need to go out to Monhegan Island in the springtime when waves of warblers are often foraging in the intertidal zone and, and among stacked uh, lobster traps. There have been winners and losers over the last 70 years. Um, of the species that breed in Maine, 27 species have shown significant increases based on annual breeding bird surveys. And these are mostly species that are habitat generalists or year-round migrants, or year-round residents or, or short-distance migrants. Um, uh, you know, if you look at wild turkeys, tufted titmice, turkey vultures, you know, they've all increased dramatically. I mean, a 19% annual increase is just like an almost vertical rise. That said, there are about 62 species of breeding birds in Maine that have been showing declining trends. Um, some of those like the 11% annual decline in bank swallows, really alarming. I think a lot of people would be surprised to see Great blackback gull numbers have been declining so dramatically over the years from their peaks in the 1970s and 80s. And a lot of the birds that are in decline are long distance migrants like neotropical um, songbirds or grassland species. But even some of the widespread species like song sparrows and American robins are showing small declines over time that we need to keep an eye on. The increases for a lot of these species are almost certainly linked to a warming climate and Climate change along with, with habitat change has allowed a lot of species to push north, uh, species like northern cardinals that have made really dramatic strides across Maine uh, since the 1970s. Um, but we've also seen the reverse. We've seen some northern birds pushing farther south, not, not many of them, but um, some intriguing exceptions like fox sparrows, which in the last couple of decades have moved more than 250 miles south out of um, southern Quebec and into Maine and neighboring states and merlins, which have just exploded south. Um, Maine did not have its first nesting merlin until 1986. They're now found not just throughout Maine, but as far south as Maryland and West Virginia. And I think the last couple of decades have, have also shown us how complicated nature can be and how changes to a single species can have, have really wide ranging ripple effects. Um, you know, the resurgence of bald eagles in Maine from just a couple of dozen pairs in the 1970s to more than 800 nesting pairs today is undeniably a conservation success story. But as eagles have recovered, they've had, they've had serious impacts on many other species of birds. Um, their recovery coincided with the recovery by great cormorants, which had once been driven completely out of the state. But as eagle numbers have grown, so has their predation on young great cormorant nesting, nestlings. So again, we see great cormorant numbers dropping drastically in Maine, largely because of great, great um, because of bald eagle predation. Um, we've seen the same thing in areas like Muscungus Bay, where bald eagles have started taking large numbers of osprey chicks and putting pressure on osprey populations. And eagles have caused the either the, the disappearance or the relocation of a number of coastal great blue heron colonies. So ups and downs depending on on what's happening. Um, 
And I mentioned a moment ago that great blackback and also herring gull populations um, have already been in steep decline from their peak in the 1980s. And that, that decline was mostly because of the closure of the off, offshore fishing industry and the closure of uh, mainland landfills. But now with, with eagle numbers increasing, the eagles are putting a lot of predation pressure on, on gull populations as well. And so we're seeing further declines in herring gull and great back, blackback gull populations. But you know, there's nothing, nothing ever operates in a vacuum. And so as gull populations have been decreasing, that's decreased the amount of pressure on common eider chicks. Uh, we've, we've started in some areas to see a reversal of the long declines in eider populations that were largely due to, especially great blackback gulls taking, uh, taking the newly hatched eider chicks. So ups and downs, lots of complications. Um, I think one of the things that we're most proud of um, on the Birds of Maine team, one of the things we take the greatest satisfaction from is knowing that we've laid down a baseline that's gonna be important for future generations as ornithologists after us continue to track the continuing changes in Maine's bird life. And one of the things that we're hoping to do with this is not simply have a static hard copy book that like Palmer's will go increasingly out of date the further and further we go from publication. We've made arrangements with, um, with Princeton and with Nuttall that within um, a certain period of time, we're gonna be able to turn the birds of Maine into a living online database that will be able to update on a regular basis and keep it um, updated and current because we've already had new species of birds added to the list of Maine's birds just since the book was published. We had our first two records of the beautiful Eurasian thrush known as the red wing um, this winter in Maine, which isn't, you're not gonna find it in the, Maine, in, in the birds of Maine because it came too late in the process. And so with that, I will um, stop screen sharing and turn my, turn my camera back on again and thank everybody for their, for their attention. And if we've got any questions, um, I'd, be, I'd be more than happy to try to answer them. Uh, thank you so much. Um, that was fabulous. I currently have the Bowdoin Library's copy of Birds of Maine at home, and I have just been pouring over it and sharing it um, with my partner and friends, and it has just been um, a magnificent uh, book to explore. Um, and I think some of the, your points about um, uh, putting together the book and the beauty of the book resonate so beautifully with um, with the Audubon book itself um, and the long journey that that took to to come into being. Yes, yeah, so so we did not have we didn't have quite the the long road to hoe that that John James Audubon had. We didn't, we didn't have to go to didn't have to go to Paris and Carol. Edinburgh and. <laughs> Thank goodness. So, um, we have a few moments for questions. If you have a question um, for Scott, please pop it into the Q&A and I will um, translate that and read it right out loud. Um, Scott, perhaps while we wait for a few moments for, mm -hmm. for questions, um, I'm curious as to whether there's a bird that you've seen recently that's been, um, that was exciting for you. <laughs> Well, the thing is, when, when, when you're a museum quality bird nerd like me, every bird is exciting. Um, <laughs> there, in, in, in my world, there's no such thing as a trash bird. Um, it's, I, I'll tell you, the one that I was really hoping to, uh, to have um, this winter, just because they, they, they have such a special place in my heart, and I've been deeply disappointed um, that they have not shown up here, were evening grosbeaks. Um, you know, growing up as a kid in Pennsylvania in the 1960s and 70s, we had evening grosbeaks every winter, and um, you know, through the 1980s, they were a regular eruptive feature of, of winter. And of course, it, they dried up after that. And part of that probably was because of the, um, uh, you know, the decline, the, the long-term decline in spruce budworm populations in Canada. The evening grosbeaks are a, a spruce budworm specialist, and. Um, but now we're seeing, we're starting to see evening grosbeak populations coming back up again because we're moving into another of these long multi-decadal cycles of spruce budworms. So um, those of you out there, if you had evening grosbeaks at your feeder this winter, I am deeply, deeply jealous of you and you should send them to Milton, Mass uh, to Milton New Hampshire where I'd be happy to have them. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we have a question from our friend Victoria um, who says, thank you so incredibly much. This presentation made my afternoon. 
Any tips for beginning beginner birders and how to get more involved with birding organizations, bird conservation, et cetera? How does one become a museum quality bird nerd? I'm not sure that's necessarily something you want to aspire to, but um, so it's, it's it, the great thing is um, the one of the few silver linings of this pandemic is a lot of people discovered birds and they discovered how restful and relaxing and exciting birding is. And it's a little bit trickier now because of the COVID restrictions, but there are a ton of um, birding organizations out there, you know, the Maine Audubon based at Gilsland Farm in, in Falmouth is a, uh, is a great resource. There are chapters up and down the state. There are local bird clubs. Um, a quick Google search will show you, you know, where they are. And many of them are going to be doing socially distanced masks, um, birding excursions this spring. In fact, some of them are doing them right now. Um, it's super easy to get involved. The easiest way to become a birder, the easiest way to get to excited about birds is to put yourself in the hands of somebody who knows what they're talking about, who can make it all a little bit more accessible in those early confusing days. And once they get you hooked, you're not, you're not going to go back again, trust me. <laughs> well, Scott, thank you so much for your time today and your enthusiasm. I feel um, some of those, um, uh, some of those statistics were just remarkable about the uh, the the turkeys um, in particular. I feel like I've just been seeing them everywhere. Um, this is a short and sweet event, so it's we're right up against one o'clock. So um, I want to thank everyone for attending today. Um, it, it's marvelous to see even just your names in um, in the participant list. We're again, Scott, so grateful you were able to join us, and a major thank you also goes out to Tony Sprague who. Um, uh, sets up our webinars and helps us uh, with all of the technology aspects of this. So um, I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon and I'm really, really looking forward um, to seeing you all next month. And um, Scott, uh, we can't wait to bring you up to Bowdoin um, when we're able to. <laughs> I'm going to hold you to that promise. Thank you so much. <laughs> Take care all. Bye-bye. Okay.